Here we go. Okay. Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. On this episode, we're talking about Earth's origins and life's limits. I'm here with Karen Rogers, an associate professor of Earth and Environmental Science and the director of the Rensselaer Astrobiology Research and Education, or RARE, Center. Great to be here. Thanks. And we're also joined by Kerb Brenneman, Dean of the School of Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and himself both a chemist and an aficionado of space exploration. Thank you. Yes. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you both for coming. Especially you, Karen, since you were just offshore on a research expedition. Um, what were you doing there and, and what were you looking for? Yes, well, I was um, out in the Caribbean Sea, um, which was a nice change from the cold weather of upstate New York here. Um, but surprisingly, I wasn't there for the sunny weather and to look at the surface of the ocean, but rather I was interested in what was at the bottom of the ocean there. Um, just south of the Grand Cayman Island is a deep sea hydrothermal spreading center. Um, and it's the deepest hydrothermal system we have on the planet. It's at 5,000 meters, which is something Around like... Around 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet. I don't work in um, imperial units much anymore. But the interesting thing about this spot is that these hydrothermal vent systems are littered with life. And we were trying to understand how life can exist in such a sort of, sort of difficult environment, at least difficult for us. Right. And so you know, one question that comes up is that uh, the Astrobiology Center, RARE, is actually funded by NASA. And uh, NASA is usually interested in things that are outside of the Earth's atmosphere and out in space. And so let's talk about uh, the connection between what you're doing and what they're interested in. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I do... Um tend to look for two things in my research program. One of them is sort of how we figure out if life is elsewhere in the, in, the, in the solar system, in the universe, and how we might detect it, and then how life got started. And so we actually went to the bottom of Earth's oceans because we use those as analogs for oceans elsewhere in the solar system. There are moons of Jupiter and moons of Saturn, particularly Europa and Enceladus, that are icy worlds, but they have oceans beneath their outer ice layer. And we think there are hydrothermal systems at the bottom of these oceans. So it's actually a little easier for me to go to the bottom of the ocean on this planet than it is for NASA to send me to the bottom of the ocean um, on, a, on a moon of Jupiter. And so we were trying and you would have, to. Do you would have missed the podcast recording if. You and had I would have, yes, yes, I would have missed a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a this is a much quicker trip. I only had to be gone for five weeks, which was a little which was a little easier, um, and it allows us to get ready for NASA's missions to Europa and Enceladus when they might actually be looking for signs of life. Um, and what we were trying to do is we were trying to um, figure out how signs of life might change when you take them out of their native environment. So um, one other thing I know uh, we've talked about a lot, Kurt, is every time we look for life on this planet, no matter where we go and how weird the place might be, we tend to find life. High temperature, low temperature, high pH, low pH, really acidic, very salty. Life seems to be everywhere on this planet. And one of the things we do in my lab is worry about life that lives in really deep parts of the planet where the pressures are high. The nice thing about that is, first of all, we find life everywhere in high pressure environments, and it is high pressure that is sort of the common thread for these oceans at the bottom of Enceladus and Europa. And I know, Karen, uh, in your work, you've developed ways of keeping that high pressure environment intact when you bring your samples back, because when you study high pressure life, you have to make sure that you don't actually alter it while you're studying it. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, just like we're not really happy when we're taken away from our homes and we travel a lot and we're away from home, most microbes that live at high pressure or high temperature or different pHs, they also don't like living very far outside their comfort zone. And in particular with high pressure life, when you take microbes that normally live at really high pressures and you bring them up to surface pressures, um, they, a lot of them don't survive and they can't grow anymore. Some of those cells will actually pop open and they'll lose their DNA, which prevents us from actually being able to analyze that DNA. And so what we did at this, um, this mid-Cayman Rise hydrothermal system is 
we looked for life signatures on cells, some of which were maintained at the pressures at the bottom of the ocean, and some of which were not. So it's a really simple sort of question to ask. It's a harder question to answer, because as you mentioned, it, it takes quite a lot of equipment to keep um, water at these elevated pressures. The pressure at the bottom of the Mid-Cayman Rise is 500 times the surface pressure that you and I are all living and breathing at right now. So it's really... Uncomfortable. It, it, it's uncomfortable for us, but the microbes love it. Now, speaking of questions that are maybe easier to ask, can I just ask, as the layperson, what is a hydrothermal system? That's a great question. Uh, the easiest way to answer that is that it's a volcano at the bottom of the ocean with oh. water in it. That's it. Can I also ask why go back and look at where life is emerging and and th how these organisms are living in these high-pressure situations? What are we looking for, and, and how will the answer to that question affect our future? That That's a, that's a great question. Um, as part of the astrobiology program at NASA, they're trying to answer a few questions. One is, how did life start? Um, another is, where might we find life elsewhere in the universe? And finally, what is it about planetary environments that allows life to continue? And that has a lot of pretty serious implications for our own future on this planet, right? NASA's not just interested in sort of microbial life at, at sort of Earth's beginnings, but they're also interested in how life and planets evolve over time and how those interactions develop. And so we were, I tend to look at slightly smaller life than us, um, but what we were really trying to understand is how we might detect evidence of life elsewhere in the solar system that might actually be living at high pressure, similar to the life that's at the high pressure at the bottom of our own oceans. And that brings up another good question. How will we understand something is living when we find it? And so, Karen, what's your definition of a living <laughs> organism? The, the definition of life, it's, you would think it would be easy, right? Um, but it turns out it's, it's not easy to, to answer at all. Um, so life as we know it here, right, on this planet, has carbon, you know, um, has water, right? So those are good um, sort of beginnings of a definition of life. But life also does chemistry. Um, life, um, it, if we left it at those three things, though, we actually would get a lot of things that weren't life, right? And so one of the interesting pieces of the definition of life is that it has to go undergo some sort of vertical or Darwinian mutation in evolution. It has to change and adapt to its environment. Because otherwise you have things like, you know, minerals and fire and computers, and they actually satisfy other definitions of life, right? They, some of those minerals can replicate, right? Fire does chemistry, but those are clearly not life. And so it's this evolution mutation part and the adaptation to environment that probably defines um, life more than, more than some of those other pieces. It really does one make one think uh, about the definition really carefully. Now, the other thing that I thought was interesting uh, about high pressure and extremophile life is that some of the proteins that are generated, for example, as part of the more traditionally uh, identifiable life forms that mm -hmm. we have here on Earth, have properties that may be of interest to the medical community and to other sorts of, uh, uh, of research. Uh, can you speak to that? A, a little bit. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> um, I'm not a medical doctor, but what we do see when we look at the biochemistry of extremophiles, um, and so those are essentially just the molecules that are in, you know, microbes that live in weird places. Um, we see that they have they have proteins just like we have proteins, and they have nucleic acids just like we have nucleic acids. But those, all of those molecules are essentially adapted for either the high temperatures or high pressures or acidities that we find in these, these sort of stranger environments. And those can be used to sort of in the laboratory to do things that our proteins and our enzymes and our nucleic acids can't do because they have a slightly different structure, right? And so um, one of the sort of transformative technology developments in the last 
what was it, 50 or so years in biology was the ability to essentially do the polymerase chain reaction. So the polymerase chain reaction um, essentially allows us to make lots and lots and lots of copies of a gene that we target. That's it. We go, we grab an organism, we grab all of its DNA, we pick which gene we want to make copies of, and we copy it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and it got way easier when we grabbed a polymerase from a high temperature microbe from Yellowstone National Park, right? Mm. Without that, um, doing the polymerase chain reaction was actually really challenging to do in the lab. It required a whole lot of um, laboratory manipulation that was difficult. Um, but once we got this um, enzyme, TAC polymerase, uh, from Thermus aquaticus, which is this cute little microbe that lives in Yellowstone, um, our whole world changed. And so there's lots of applications like that. And actually, this goes to, to forensics as well. For example, uh, this is one of the ways that uh, DNA samples are amplified so that you can do DNA matching, for example. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, of really amazing applications that go way beyond that as well. And one might wonder why uh, a high temperature polymerase would help us. Well, the problem really was that at lower temperatures where that normal polymerase would tend to like to live, uh, the reactions are too slow. And so if you can use much higher temperatures, the reactions go faster. This is sort of a, a typical axiom of chemistry. Higher temperatures means faster reaction. And um, if you treat a protein that doesn't like being at high temperature, uh, you get that protein changing into something else, like when you scramble eggs, for example. So uh, basically what we have been talking about here is trying to look at high, high temperature, high pressure, high pH, unusual environments for the reasons why we're interested in how Earth came to be. And I can tell you that there's a, an interesting history of that here at Rensselaer. There's a, a direct connection uh, f uh, from, the, uh, from the beginning of at least when I got here over 30 years ago, and it was going on before that, uh, where there was a study going on about what kinds of chemistry could take place on minerals, for example, that might then uh, lead to something that could self-replicate. And uh, this became another effort later, which then grew into yet another effort that Karen has now led and is leading. And uh, we're very excited about where this is going to go. And the NASA connection is no accident either. We have uh, NASA connections going way back uh, to George Lowe, uh, who was our president uh, here at Rensselaer, after he finished leading uh, a very significant component of the Apollo program. Uh, and also connections to later missions, for example, uh, the Mars Curiosity rover. Uh, had two experiments that were run by people who were at Rensselaer at the time. And uh, a whole variety of things uh, have gone on that directly relate NASA and its developments and its future to Rensselaer. And we're really proud of that. Yeah, it's, you know, coming to Rensselaer six and a half, seven years ago now, um, having come from a whole lot of work with, with NASA, I didn't really feel like um, I, was, I was all that far afield from NASA. We have faculty here who have sent experiments to the International Space Station. We have faculty who do space navigation for NASA. It's really a very NASA-rich um, sort of place to be, and it's really exciting. And, you know, we were, you were talking about some of these molecules like nucleic acids and polymerases um, and how these molecules that are we sort of pull out of microbes from strange environments, um, how they help us in the laboratory to do modern biochemistry and chemistry and biology and molecular biology. But one of the things we study in the Rare Center is how those molecules got started in the first place. And that, that also has a long history at, at Rensselaer, as you were talking about. Um, Jim Ferris did an amazing amount of work trying to understand how nucleic acids react on mineral surfaces. And he did that because he was interested in understanding how you go from a, a planet that doesn't have life to one that supports the chemistry that eventually leads to life. It's not an easy thing to go from rocks and water and volcanoes to something that actually has microbes on it. And so one of the things we're doing as part of the Rare Center is we're really sort of turning this question of 
sort of Earth's earliest chemistry and how that leads to life on its head. And what we're, this is, it's really, we're very, really excited about it. We're building what we call the Early Earth Laboratory. And in this laboratory in the basement of the Science Center, we're designing a bunch of new experimental devices that allow us to replicate the conditions that we, we think we're on the early Earth, right? So a um, little warmer than sort of what it is today, probably some more volcanic activity, um, a, a mineralogy, so rocks and minerals that are similar to what we have today, but probably a slightly different composition sort of overall in bulk, and a very different atmosphere from what we have today. And so we're, we're really sort of developing new apparatus that allow us to have water and rocks react under those sort of early earth atmospheric conditions. And we're trying to understand what kinds of organic chemistry come out of those sort of environmental scenarios. And we're looking for the ones that lead to molecules that look like the molecules we have in life today. And what we're trying to sort of hopefully understand is which environments of the early earth might have actually helped life sort of come along and, and emerge under those um, conditions of the, so of what, the earth. So what was the previous approach? You said you turned it on its head. Was it more working backwards? Yeah, that's. Mm. And, and I'm glad you asked it that way. Um, in origins of life research or emergence of life prebiotic chemistry, we often talk about bottom-up and top-down approaches to this question. Um, and a lot of what um, has been done and, and has really taught us a lot about prebiotic chemistry is starting with life today and taking a sort of taking it apart into its bits and figuring out what it's made of, right? It's made of proteins and it's made of nucleic acids and it's made of some, some lipids or some fats. Um, and then trying to synthesize those in the laboratory, right? And that's, that's sort of where our, our long history in prebiotic um, chemistry sort of starts here at Rensselaer. Um, and so what we're doing instead is we're, we're using all of those results, um, but instead we're trying to see which environments sort of produce different kinds of organic molecules. So rather than just targeting nucleic acids and their polymerization, or just targeting um, particular metabolisms, right? Or just targeting amino acids and sort of peptides or enzymes. These are sort of strings of amino acids. We're actually targeting environments that we know existed on the early earth. Because whatever chemistry came out of those environments is the chemistry of the early earth that did give us life. We just have to figure out which environments were the good ones and which ones weren't. One of the things that you may have noticed and is kind of embedded in that question is that there's, there are elements of, of geology, uh, you know, oceanography, uh, chemistry, chemistry, biology, biology we even do some everything sort of in this. Sort of biophysics, some. And some physics, right? Trying yes. to understand how molecules interact. Well, the physicists would argue that it's all physics. <laughs> and well, we have that argument all the time. Uh, uh, anyway, so the other thing is the computational pr uh, component of this. Uh, there are uh, groups that are related to this who are working on, for example, understanding what happens to protein structures under high pressure, yep, for that's example. Right. That's right. And, uh, you know, one of the things about Rensselaer is we have these low walls, which I've appreciated a lot in being here, uh, in working across disciplines and across uh, departments and, and schools. And uh, I think that is embodied actually in the rare center. And so, you know, amongst all those things we're talking about here being studied that come together to give us what we have and, and what we will have, um, there's a tremendous amount of, of synergy that's going on. Yeah, it's true. And I, I was, um, the computational part is a big part of the rare center. Uh, I, I just sort of cavalierly described that we're going to replicate all of the early Earth conditions in the laboratory. It's actually a little more challenging than that because there are lots of different sort of variables that could change um, in all of these different kinds of early Earth environments. And so as part of this early Earth laboratory, we're also going to have the virtual early Earth laboratory. Um, and in the virtual or early Earth laboratory, we're going to model these environments, um, both their chemistry, their fluid flow, their temperature, their pressure. Um, and those, those models are essentially going to point us in directions of which environmental parameters might lead to more successful organic chemistry that we need for 
life's emergence and which ones might not. And so that way we can sort of use those models to better target and better focus the physical experiments we do in the lab because we can't actually do every last possibility of temperature and pressure and chemistry and flow and rock and mineralogy. Um, and so we're going to use this virtual early earth lab to, to target that. But the nice thing about this computational resource is that this will be also a visual sort of virtual early earth lab. And so people will be able to go online um, and sort of look at models of hydrothermal systems and see what changes if you change the heat flow on the planet or if you change the atmospheric composition. How does the chemistry of the ocean change and the chemistry of this sort of hydrothermal system or this you know, water flowing through volcanoes? We'll be able to actually visualize that in the virtual early earth lab before we actually go into the physical lab and make that experiment happen. Now, do you suppose that this might extend to having people outside of the university be able to experiment on their own with the computational tools? Yeah, and that, that was the original design of the virtual early earth lab. It really wasn't for us. I mean, we were going to do this work anyway. But to make it accessible and visual to the rest of the sort of prebiotic chemistry community is really a, a really, it's, I think it's going to be a game changer for this field um, because trying to understand what's truly possible on the early earth is not as tractable as you would think. Right? The early Earth was a very complicated place, um, and if you're looking at very specific kinds of environments, maybe you're worried about um, a pool of water on the side of a volcano, right? That has a very different composition than, you know, water at the bottom of the ocean. And for the entire community of prebiotic chemists who are out there who aren't geologists and don't study the early Earth, that's, that's sort of a hard thing to, to sort of get right the first time when they're trying to set up experiments. And so part of the design of this virtual sort of meeting place is for everyone to go and have a clearinghouse for experiments before they start them, right? If I do this experiment in this way with this chemistry and this temperature and this pressure and whatever, is that actually realistic for the early Earth or is it not? And if it's not, how do I change my experimental parameters so it's a little more realistic? And that, that I think, will help the community at large a lot because we can sort of get away from sort of prebiotic chemistry experiments that might be really successful in that they make really interesting molecules, but they make them under conditions that, were pro that probably never existed on the planet. And so I think it's really meant more for the rest of the community, and I think it's going to really sort of change the way this the, – this research program works. Now, there's one thing that I think maybe uh, our listeners might like to know, and that is what are we referring to when we talk about the early Earth? What is the timeline here? Because uh, as we know that, uh, you know, in, in our Earth and Environmental Science Department, we actually have people that study the Earth as far back as four and a half billion years ago. That's right. And that's pretty much the age of the Earth, um, little, just, just a little over four and a half billion. Um, you know, in in geology, we talk about this idea of deep time a lot. And what we mean by deep time, it's, it's really sort of um, the idea that it's hard for us as humans to understand what four and a half billion years means. I mean, billion's a, a big word, right? Most of us can't understand what four and a half billion dollars would be. It's also really hard to understand what four and a half billion years is. It's just a whole lot. Um, if you think about it, the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. It's barely a sort of a blip in that entire history of the, of the planet, right? It's really, really recent. When I think about the early Earth and what we're trying to sort of replicate in the lab and study for prebiotic chemistry, we're really talking about the planet um, from about four and a half billion when it sort of started to sort of aggregate and turn into a planet um, to about four billion, right? Maybe as, as young as three and a half billion years ago. So it's really just the first half billion or maybe the first billion years of Earth's history. That's probably when life and sort of life's chemistry really got started. So it was a really long time ago. The first half billion years is something we call the Hadean era of Earth's history. Um, 
we named it that because we used to think it was like really really hot and kind of magma ocean and really, you know, more like Hades. Um, but it turns out, thanks to um, some work that Professor Watson has done in Earth yep, and Bruce Watson. Sciences, he's fantastic, turns out by about 4.4 billion years ago, the Earth, you know, had calmed down quite a bit, had liquid water on it. Um, so some of it looked very much like it does today. The thing that was different, though, was the atmosphere. We had no oxygen mm -hmm. for the first at least two billion years of Earth's history. So that part was different. Well, as an individual living now in 2020, how, how did you get interested in, in the <laughs> early Earth and a time when no people were around and, and it was just maybe not like Hades, but not the most livable? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I, um, I'll, I'll try and give you the brief version <laughs> of how I got into science and how I landed here, or recently at the bottom of the ocean. Right. Right. Well, I stayed on the ship, by the way. We sent a robot to the bottom of the ocean. But I, you know, I actually started out as a math major, which make all my math colleagues very happy. Um, and then as an undergrad, I got to go outside because um, they that's what we do as geologists. I took a geology class. We went outside. We started hammering on rocks, and that was pretty fun. Um, and then in my first year of graduate school, I took a field trip to Yellowstone National Park we were just talking about and it's the most fascinating place to go because there are hot springs there of all different colors um, of all different chemistries of fluid and you learn that there are microbes living there and from that moment I was totally hooked because I didn't understand how they did it like how do you live there I mean these hot springs were bubbling up sort of minerals that were just precipitating in the water because the water was so different than lake water or the Hudson River or anything like that. And I just didn't understand how they were doing that. And pretty much since then I've been hooked, sort of how does life survive in really weird places? And now I've moved on to, to sort of how did life start in maybe a really weird place like on the early earth? And I can't seem to get away from it. Life is, lives in weird places and I'm gonna figure out why. <laughs> You know, I, I guess the obvious next question is, lives in really weird places here on Earth. Do you think it lives in really weird places elsewhere? I think there are at least lots of really weird places elsewhere that look like the weird places here that life survives in. So I wouldn't be surprised if we find life um, elsewhere in the solar system that at least got started in, in very sort of similar types of environments. I've had the um, sort of, I've been able to study um, Mars analog sites as well. Mars used to have water on it, um, certainly had volcanoes. Um, and so Mars is a really good target for where life might have sort of been active at some time in Martian history, maybe even the subsurface of Mars today. Um, as I was mentioning, Europa and Enceladus, ocean worlds that probably have these sort of underwater volcanoes, really good targets um, for life elsewhere. One of the things that I think about, though, when I think about life elsewhere is microbial life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely think of little green men anymore. So we may not recognize our neighbors when we find them. You know, it's, it's hard to spot a microbe, um, particularly if it's sort of been dead for a while, right? And that's, that sort of brings us back to why I was at the bottom of the ocean is not only how, how do we define life, but how do we look for life elsewhere? NASA spends a lot of time trying to understand what a biosignature is, and that is really just something in the rock record or even in water, if there's, if there's water, that is clear evidence for life. As, as folks who look for life or try to look for life elsewhere in the solar system, we worry a lot about how we're going to find signatures that are really definitive. Well, uh, we've talked about Mars, we've talked about Saturn, and we've talked about Jupiter. Um, and Earth. And Earth, <laughs> and uh, those analogs. And then, of course, Venus has attracted some recent interest again, uh, because it also represents a different sort of environment. Very hot, lots of carbon dioxide, thick atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll be talking about that in the future again. All right, well, we'll have you back for that conversation. Thank you. That sounds <laughs> yes. great, thank you. Thank you very much.
This episode of Why Not Change the World was recorded in the soloist suite of MPAC, the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center. Thank you to the MPAC staff for their assistance, and thank you for listening. <laughs>